I'm troubled by such things, but of course the Covenanters would have met in any weather, so we should probably put up with whatever comes so much. We need to button down the hatches in any way by carrying on out here. We're not going to take refuge in the church. But welcome all for our conventicle here in Balmacleon Churchyard. We didn't manage one last year because of COVID, but thankfully we'll get back now to our, our regular one a year, remembering some of the stories of the Covenanters over the past years in the Glen Cairns. Well, McClellan Churchyard has a number of connections to the Covenanters. There's the grave of Covenanter Robert Grierson, who was a local man who was martyred for his faith, along with four others in Glencairn Parish on Ingleston Farm. More of them later. And there is the grave of the parish minister, Thomas Werner, just up there. I'm going to maybe suggest we decamp. Well, there may be, may be probably easier to stay here and then invite you at the end of the service to go over and look at his stone just over there. Uh, he was a strong supporter of the Covenanting cause and, and survived until after the times of trouble and persecution. And set into the churchyard wall, of course, there is a statue of Robert Patterson, Old Mortality, the stonemason immort immortalised by Sir Walter Scott, who dedicated himself to erecting or renewing stones in memory of the Covenanting martyrs. He was based in Balmaclellan for the latter part of his life. And in fact, his wife ran a free school here in the village to support the family. She's buried here in the church yard along with her family, and some, at least some of the family, and old mortality is mentioned on that stone, which I'd be happy to give, show people afterwards if they're not sure where it is. Although, of course, uh, uh, Patterson himself, old mortality, was buried in Calaverock Cemetery. It's Calaverock Churchyard. We come to, though, to, in the open air, as the Covenanters did, to worship God, and we begin with Psalm 91. Oh, come and let us to the Lord. I will try and start you off. <laughs> I'll stand to sing. Well, you're welcome to sit if you want. of earth and heaven, we come before you as your people in this hallowed ground in the midst of the beauties of your creation. We do not meet today in our church buildings made by our hands and dedicated to your glory, 
but we stand out in the open air, conscious of the unseen host of witnesses of past generations who have entered into their rest and received their crown of glory and now dwell in your nearer presence. They are buried all about us, and those who had put their trust in Christ have been raised to newness of life. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are their Lord, and you are our Lord. And though there is a veil that separates us from them, we are all one as your people. Help us to be your faithful people in our own time. In your hands are the depths of the earth. The strength of the hills is yours. You are not only a great and mighty God, but a loving God who is interested in every little detail of our lives. We're thankful that for most of us our lines have fallen in pleasant places compared to the some of these the Covenanters had to endure. We recognise that too often our lives are riddled with compromise and we live too self-sufficiently. We fail to put our trust in you. We fail to remember that our lives are dependent on you. You give us life and breath and in the end our eternity rests in your hands. Help us to recognize you in the daily fabric of our lives, to live lives open to you. Forgive us our half-heartedness and give us a fresh vision of your love for us, your purposes for our lives, that we might learn to live in daily dependence on you and make ourselves available to you to be the channels of your love into the lives of others. Help us to see how in Jesus Christ you have drawn close to us and that the same love of Christ that won the covenanters of 300 years ago to such rugged faith and commitment to you is extended to us in our own time. Today, it is
Sonatas, who was shot dead over in Glencairn Parish at the same time as Robert Grierson, before he died, asked to read and pray. And he read, we're told, part of Psalm 17, followed by part of John's Gospel, chapter 16. I'm going to read out now John, John, Psalm 17 and then John 16, verses 1 to 4. In a way, Psalm 17 is all of it appropriate. I'm not sure which part he read out. You can maybe guess yourself what part it was, although perhaps it was, in fact, the whole psalm that he had rec recited. But I'm sure it was something that, words that he knew well. He didn't have to pick up a book to read it. He knew it by heart. Psalm 17. Hear, O Lord, my, hear, o Lord, my righteous plea. Give ear to my prayer. It does not rise from deceitful lips. May my vindication come from you. May your eyes see what is right. Though you probe my heart, examine me in my teeth. Though you test me, you will find nothing. I've resolved that my mouth will not sin. As for the deeds of men, by the words of God, your paths. I call on you, God, for you will answer me. Give ear to me and hear my prayer. Show the wonder of your great love, you who save by your right hand those who take refuge in you from their foes. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who assail me, from my mortal enemies who surround me. They close up their callous hearts and their mouths speak with arrogance. They have tracked me down, they now surround me, with eyes alert to throw me to the ground. They are like a lion hungry for prey, like a great lion crouching in cover. Rise up, O Lord, confront them, bring them down. Rescue me from the wicked by your sword, O Lord, by your hand save me from such men, from men of this world whose reward is in this life. You still the hunger of those you cherish. Their sons have plenty, and they store up wealth for you, their children. And I, in righteousness, I shall see your face. When I awake, I'll, I shall be satisfied with seeing your likeness. I'm turning to... John chapter 16, where we read, we hear some of Jesus' words to his disciples at the Last Supper. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first, because I was with you. We sing now Psalm 19, now festival. Oh, with the tender mercy. 
is born, a stealthy satisfied. So we rejoice, shall go all our days, and still be glad in Thee. O let Thy work and power appear, Thy servant's face before, and show unto their children dear. the days of the persecution were traumatic days. In the 17th century, many Scottish Presbyterians refused to accept the Episcopalian form of worship imposed by Charles I and went on to sign the National Covenant in 1638. After the, re after the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, when Charles II came to the throne, in, attempt, in a, an attempt to force the openly rebellious worshippers of Scotland to acknowledge him as head of the church, to accept the reintroduction of bishops, and to adopt the 1637 prayer book, it was ordained that any minister refusing to acknowledge these changes should be dismissed and replaced by an appropriate Episcopalian curate. Thus it was that the Reverend Thomas Werner, who had become minister of Balmaclellan in 1657, was ousted from his pulpit. I will return to speak more of him in a moment. By law, any person between the ages of 16 and 60 who refused to attend the reintroduced prayer book services at which all calls were taken had to pay a fine, the money to be collected by soldiers billeted locally. Between 1663 and 1666, the fines totaled. 6,430 pounds of salts were imposed by the troops on 49 families in Balmaclellan Parish. Only one parish in the Stuart Street of was fined more. If the offender could not pay his fine once, his goods, furnishings, stock and crops were seized and sold, or he had troops quartered on him to eat him out of house and numerous occasions. The fines were far larger than they should have been so that the soldiers could pocket something for themselves. Even this fails to describe the full extent of the misery inflicted on the people. Women and children were molested and made to suffer all manner of indignities at the hands of the soldiers. The more defiant had their homes burnt down. Hundreds were made monks, living in hoods, in caves, or in turf and stone shelters they built on the moors. Robert McClellan, the laird of Barsco within the parish of Bar McClellan, was an ardent covenanter, and he found it necessary to seek refuge in the hills within the parish of Dalry in order to escape the predations of Sir James Turner and his dragoons, who had been sent to Galloway to cool down. On the 13th of November 1666, Barscope left the sanctuary of the hills with three companions, driven down by the cold and rain, to seek a brief respite in an inn in Dalry. There they came across an old man being tortured by the soldiers and came to his aid. That intervention 
escalated into the Pentland Rising, or what should perhaps better and more accurately be known as the Glen Ken's Uprising. But that is another story. But to turn now to the Covenanter martyr buried here in Balmaclellan churchyard. According to his to Morton in his book Galloway and the Covenanters, many Covenanters have regulated the language and keeping things to the bar in Money Eye Parish. However, in April 1685, at the height of what was known as the Killing Times, the location of this refuge was betrayed to the authorities by Andrew Watson, a former Covenanter who had deserted the cause. Early in the morning of the 16th of April 1685, Acting on Watson's information, Colonel James Douglas, brother of the Lord of the Queen's Mother, and John Livingston, and a party of soldiers, stealthily came to the cave and captured five fugitives. These were John Gibson, the brother of the Laird of Ingleston, James Bennett from Glen Cairn, Robert Mitchell from Cumnock, and Robert Edgar and Robert Grierson from Balmaclellan. When the dragoons came up, they fired into the cave and wounded one of the Covenanters, and then rushed in and seized the five. They were dragged out and ordered to be shot. Gibson's mother and sister, hearing, hearing of their capture, rushed up and pleaded for his life to be spared, but in vain. The soldiers however allowed him to speak to them, and Gibson asked them not to grieve for him. He was allowed to pray, which he did in a way that even impressed the soldiers. He read part of Psalm 17 and John 16, and after praying again, the other four were not allowed to pray, and were immediately shot. One of them was still alive and was thrust through with a sword. And as he died, he cried, Though every hair of my head were a man, I am willing to die all these deaths for Christ and his cause. Gibson, Edgar, Benach and Mitchell were all buried in Glen Cairn churchyard, where stones were erected in their memory. The recent body was carried back to Balmaclen, buried here. The stone before the streets. Here, Lyon, Robert Myers, who was shot to death by the command of Colonel James Douglas at Ingallstown, in the Park of Glen Park, Anno 1685. This monument to passengers shall cry that goodly Grierson under it will fly, betrayed by knavish Watson to his foes, which made this martyr's day by murder cross. Of his crime, then read the story of the killing of the lands concealed, designed to make our south their hunting field. Here, one of five at once were laid to dust. Carabines, when bullets and bullets could have reached their souls, these mighty Nimrods would then have cut off. For there could no request, three minutes yet, to pray for the future rest. We recognise today how he sacrificed his life rather than deny his faith and his blood. To return to Thomas Burton, I mentioned that many of the confirmed Presbyterians escaped to the wilds of the Out in the wilds they would hold open air services or conventicles presided over by a displaced minister and Thomas Werner presided over many such gatherings. All the Glen Cairns ministers had been evicted from their parishes for being unwilling to accept the new Episcopalian system that the king had sought to impose on them and they were forced to leave the area or survive on the moors or in the woods as they were able. Thomas Werner, after being ejected from his position in 1662, had taken on the tenancy of a small farm on the shore of Loch Inbar. He 
was always willing to meet his former people when he could do so safely, and they were always willing to meet with him. Many of the people were loath to have their children baptised by the curates and would wait for an opportunity to have them baptised by one of the outed ministers. It is on record that Thomas Werner preached to a gathering at the Holy Lynn on the nearby Garfield Burn, which he baptised no less than 36 children at one time. Around 1687, the persecution of the Covenanters relaxed, relaxed somewhat, and although there was still some danger in meeting openly, the troops were less active in patrolling the countryside. And in the spring of 1688, Gordon of Grenon, who did not wish his infant son to be baptised by the curate of Dalry, requested of Thomas Werner that he might perform that ceremony. The latter was asked to officiate as a general baptism of not only Gordon's son, but other children who had remained unbaptised. And Werner was asked to choose the location where this might take place. He fixed a day and added, I will take the top of some hill in the neighbourhood of Grenon and St John's Clare. The choice surprised many people, who had rather assumed that he would have chosen a secluded place like the Holy Lynn. There were several other infants in and around the village of Dorai who had not been baptised. Some of their parents had wished William Boyd, a young clergyman who had not yet been ordained to officiate. He had been licensed to preach by the Cameronians. Boyd, however, declined as one not yet suitably qualified. But he was among the company that gathered for the baptisms. And so a morning of sunshine after a very dark and cloudy day, cloudy dawn, 20 or 30 people assembled on the top of the Mullach, along with Thomas Vernon. From there, the countryside of the Glencairns was spread out all around them in one of the finest views to be had with them. A prayer was pronounced, and immediately after, 17 children were presented for baptism and the ceremony performed with water brought from a nearby spring. After prayer concluded the ceremony. Before the gathering broke up, Mr. Boyd asked Werner why he had chosen the top of a hill rather than the Garpal Glen. The venerable man looked up at the sun, then at some dark clouds vanishing to the south, and immediately said with firmness, William, this was a very dark morning, but now you feel the sun shining in splendor. If I am not mistaken, the storm of persecution will soon blow over and the sun of Presbyterian prosperity fling his beams upon us. It is for this reason that I chose this elevated spot, where I can see at once the houses of Alston, Ken Muir, Arder, and Barscombe, all of whom have participated in our troubles. And I hope that we shall all, in a short while, That should take place, said Mr. Royd. I wish you may be restored to Bar McClellan. And may I, under heaven, be the minister of the Perhaps returned the veteran of Burma. After this, the party dispersed, each going in peace to his own home. in Balmaclellan. He continued there until his death in September 1716, at the grand old age of 85. At his death was the father of the church, the longest serving minister of the whole of the church. You can see his tombstone. He reads, here lies the corpse of Reverend Thomas Werner, who served his generation according to the will of God in the Gospel at Balma Clement, 59 years, died the 10th of September 1716, and of his age the 86th year. 
the last of the old Presbyterian ministers that survived the revolution. Shortly after the conventicle, Boyd went to Holland, where he became friendly with William of Orange. He accompanied him to this country, and on his, on his accession to the throne, proclaimed him king at Glasgow Cross. He was admitted to the Church of Scotland in October 1690, and shortly after, ordained minister of Dora. He is buried in Dolai Kirkyard. Times of persecution came to an end.
we just give a short prayer. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us as your people. We recognize that compared to what the Covenant has had to endure those centuries ago in this area, indeed our lives have fallen in Christ. But we thank you that you are a faithful God and help us to walk in your ways and know your strength and your power as well. Shed abroad in our lives and continue to live our lives day by day. sing now our closing song, Psalm 106, Give Thanks and Praise to the Lord. Praise and thanks unto the Lord, for one day full is He, His tender mercy does endure unto eternity.